Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Mobile Robot Systems course. In this fourth lecture, we will be talking about robot perception. In particular, we will take a look at how to derive sensor models and why they are useful. We'll take a look at a few sensor types, and at the end, we'll spend a little time talking about odometry and sensor fusion. Without further ado, let's get started. So in this lecture, I'll be introducing you to concepts of sensing and perception for autonomous robots. In particular, we'll be looking at a few popular sensing uh, sensors with respect to their hardware concept. We'll be developing their sensor model, so the formal sensor model, and we'll also be looking at applications that use these sensors uh, to do useful things. And at the end, we'll spend a little bit of time discussing um, odometry because this is a very crucial type of sensing for mobile robots. So where does um, sensing and perception lie in the whole um, outline of this course? Uh, as you see here, we have this perception element where we're really going to look at how we're using perception um, in the context of robots that are ground robots, which will essentially be using perception to either localize or navigate to places. So that is the general idea that I want you to have in mind as we go through the various sensors and sensing um, basics or fundamentals in this given lecture. So back to our perception action loop. Um, I'd like to just briefly describe where perception actually, actually sits in this, um, in this action loop and what the role is. So again, to recall what perception is, perception algorithms infer information about the state of the world. And they do this in such a way that the robot can use their output to make decisions about the actions that the robot would next take, right? And since we're focusing on mobile ground robots in this course, perception in our case will really be related to um, localization and navigation, right? And the decisions that will then be based on these um, outputs, outputs from the perception modules will be related to motion um, and navigation, okay? So how do robots perceive the environment? Okay, and and um, what? how do sensors actually lend themselves to this problem? So first of all, what is a sensor? Maybe we can start by defining um, what a sensor actually does for us. So a sensor is a component that measures some aspects about the state of the world or the state of the robot. So when I talk about the state of the world, for example, this could be measuring the position of a given object that is not the robot itself. And when I say, when I say state of the robot, for example, I could be trying to measure the position of the robot itself in some coordinate frame, a global coordinate frame, for example. Okay? But the state can also be something that is not related to geodesics. For example, a robot could be trying to infer the intention of another agent. Right. So this could be some sort of state of the world that the robot is trying to estimate. To give you a very concrete example, if you think about autonomous vehicles, one of the things that um, they would ideally be able to do is to infer the intention of, say, pedestrians or other vehicles around them. Because if they can infer those intentions, they can plan out their trajectories as a function of the trajectories of the autonomous agents around them, right? So this is a kind of a state of the world that robots might want to be trying to estimate via perception algorithms. Now, I'm just going to make a very simple example in the context of open versus closed loop control, which are concepts that you are now very familiar with, right? So what we would like to do here in this little um, very simple example is we want a robot to move towards a wall and stop at a distance of 20 centimeters to that wall. Now, if we think of closed loop control, you'll recall I always mentioned, well, we have this oracle that is telling the robot what its state is and allows it to implement the closed loop control paradigm, right? So what we're meaning here specifically is that the robot is going to use the feedback on its distance to the wall to decide whether or not it's going to stop moving. And what it needs in order to do this is simply some sensor and a perception algorithm that allows it to infer how far it is from that wall. Right? And so this is how sensing and perception connects to the idea of closed loop control. And you'll recall the alternative here is open loop control, where the robot maybe knows its starting position, 
and it might be able to track how far it's moving, but it's not going to be using any sensors or perception to actually tell it how far it truly is from the wall. So inevitably, in open loop control, the robot will stop at a distance from the wall that is probably less precise than the distance it would have stopped from the wall at had it been using um, closed loop control with some extra receptive sensors that are telling it how far it truly is from the wall. Okay. But obviously, this is not always true, what I just said, because it will depend on the sensors that you're using to measure those external aspects, right, distance to wall, versus the precision and accuracy of the sensors that the robot is using to measure its own movement, right? So, of course, we have to take that into account. But this is just an example that brings perception and sensing into the context of open loop versus closed loop control. So now in terms of sensor types at the very highest level, there are two types of sensors, right? So there are exteroceptive sensors that measure something external to the robot. And there are proprioceptive sensors that measure something internal to the robot. Okay? So if we look at the class of exteroceptive sensors, again, there are two types that we like to use to distinguish these, um, these sensors within this class. And these two types are active exteroceptive sensors versus passive exteroceptive sensors. So the active ones are defined by the fact that they affect the environment by emitting energy. So, for example, we can think of infrared um, distance sensors that actually emit infrared light, right? And they then measure the received light intensity to determine how far they are from the objects that actually reflected this emitted light or emitted energy, right? We can also think of ultrasound sensors, which emit sound waves and measure the round trip time of flight. Um, or we can think of laser scanners. Right, that emit, emit um, uh, focused light. And there are many other examples of active sensors, but these are three of the most common or popular um, active sensors that are used in uh, localization and navigation. In the class of passive sensors, we have, for example, ambient light sensors. So those could, for example, be infrared receivers, but those that do not actually emit any energy. Or we could be measuring sound, or we could be measuring uh, well, we could be measuring vision or camera, right? Using a camera, um, trying to estimate um, the, the visual state of our environment without actually affecting it. Okay? So the key thing here with passive sensors is that they only measure incident energy and of course in various forms, right? So the different types of sensors are measuring different um, energy mo modalities. In the class of proprioceptive sensors, um, we have different types of sensors that measure something about the robot itself. And this is, of course, very useful, not only in terms of um, navigation and um, localization, but also in order to manage the internal health of a robot. So I'm talking about, for example, energy levels or whether or not the robot is off balance, right? If we're talking about walking robots and robots that need to maintain um, stability. So those kinds of sensors are also very important and allow the robots to, uh, to achieve their tasks successfully. And as I mentioned in the previous slides, um, odometry will be a sensor or a sensing um, foundation that we will talk about quite a bit in this course because it's really important and crucial to um, uh, one of the aspects that we'll be looking at that enable a robot to know where it is and where it is going. Okay. So now let's dive in and look at a specific case study, which here is the class of distance sensors. So distance sensors are actually one of the most common types of sensors used for localization and navigate, navigation. And they usually work by emitting a signal um, and receiving its reflection from an object if there are any objects in the robot's immediate vicinity. Now, distance sensors usually rely on two different uh, measuring principles to determine the relevant features we would then use within our perception algorithms. So the first of those two principles is time of flight or round trip time of flight, where we make one assumption, which is that the signal travel speed is known. 
And once we know that quantity and we, we can measure emission and receival times of uh, the signal, then we can infer something about the distance between the robot body and any reflecting object, right? And this is how distance sensors relying on time of flight are useful. Then the second principle is received signal strength, where we make the assumption that the signal attenuation is known, right? Um, so, uh, in other words, we assume something about uh, the model of the decrease in signal intensity as a signal propagates throughout space. So you know how signal attenuates over distance. Um, typically, this is harder and more imprecise than round trip time of flight or time of flight, especially since signal attenuation is quite dependent on the environment and the environment is generally unknown because that's what we're trying to perceive, right? But these two classes are the more uh, popular and well-known uh, sensing principles and for uh, completeness, we will be discussing examples that belong to both of these classes. So fitting or matching up examples of actual sensing modalities to these measurement principles is one of the things we're going to do in this lecture. So we are going to look at infrared sensors that rely on received signal strength. We're going to be looking at ultrasound sensors that rely on round-trip time of flight, and we're also going to be having a, a quick look at how laser sensing works, also based on the time of flight measurement principle. So let's take a look at our first example, which is given to us by infrared proximity sensors. So infrared sensors or infrared proximity sensors, as their name already gives away, they rely on infrared light as their main sensing modality. And this is useful because infrared light has long wavelengths, uh, invisible to the human eye, and can still be relatively easily sensed by um, relatively cheap sensing hardware. So in the particular case of IR sensor, the emitter is made with an, uh, an LED diode, and the detector is usually a photodiode or a phototransistor. So the measurement principle is based on uh, the fact that we can detect the presence of an object by measuring the intensity of reflected light, right? So recall that infrared proximity sensors are active sensors. And uh, we assume here that the light intensity decreases with the square of the distance from the source and this relationship can be used to then measure the approximate distance to the object, right? When ambient light must be subtracted, sensors can also take a measurement um, of the light without emissions, right? Or we can alternatively also put a passive optical infrared filter in front of the detector to filter out daylight. Okay, so those are various ways in which we can use infrared proximity sensors. Um, as I mentioned before, they're very popular, especially for, especially for educational robots or cheaper robots. Uh, because infrared circuitry and the infrared um, sensors themselves, those photodiodes, are very cheap to produce. They're standard off-the-shelf components and the uh, little PCB boards that we use for them are also very easy to construct and print. Now the main disadvantage of infrared proximity sensors is that they actually, so the signals or the, the, that, are, that are reflected and how they're being reflected will str strongly depend on the f reflecting object's characteristics. So for example, if the reflection um, happens on a smooth surface, the reflection will be much stronger than if it happens on a rugged, non-smooth surface where we have light being scattered in various directions versus in smooth, with smooth surfaces, all of the light being focused and coming back to the receiver. Similarly, similarly, you'll find that white surfaces tend to reflect more light and darker surfaces tend to absorb more light, and this will also affect um, the receiver's sensor measurements and will in turn affect the estimated distance to the given objects. Okay? So those are the main disadvantages of using infrared as a sen sensing modality for distance. Now, the key question that we ask ourselves, and this is relevant to any type of sensor, is how do we actually relate a sensor measurement to a perceptive feature, right? So a perceptive feature can be um, anything really, but it tends to be the, the, the quantity that we're interested in or that we can most usefully use within a perception algorithm. So for example, distance. Distance is a perceptive feature. 
And one way we can create this relationship is through a process that is called calibration. And we're going to have a look at the, an example of how to calibrate an infrared proximity sensor. This process of calibration, what it produces for us is actually a sensor model. And the sensor model is the formality that relates um, the output of a sensor to our perceptive feature. So the goal of any calibration procedure is to determine the mapping between the sensor reading and a desired feature. And it relies on three main steps, where the first step uses a ground truth telemetry system to set up the sensor. The second step then consists of measuring and tabulating um, these measured values um, with respect to the ground truth values that we used in the setup of step one. And the third step consists of actually fitting a curve to create a more compact representation of the relationship between um, sensor output and perceptive feature. Okay. So in order to create these compact representations um, of these measurement feature relationships, uh, there are different ways we can think of doing this. One way is to think about creating a curve or fitting a curve to the, set, the collected sensor measurements. And this curve would then ideally correspond um, in the case of infrared sensors, for example, to a signal whose intensity decreases with the square of the distance, because this is something that we know from first principles how infrared proximity is supposed to behave, right? Um, and you can see here in, in this plot that I'm showing you, as expected, um, that the sensor will actually not return the same value for each distance. Now, why is that? Well, if we go back and think about um, some of the things I talked uh, about in the preceding lectures, one of the key items I kept on stressing was that in any robotic system, there will be uncertainty. And this uncertainty arises due to um, malfunction or cheap production of the sensors, but also to uncertainties and unmodeled or undermodeled artifacts in the environment. Right? So it is quite normal that if you place your sensor in front of a wall at a fixed distance and you don't move it, repeated measurements will not always be the same. There happens to be noise. Now, one of the key questions that calibration and sensor models deal with is exactly how to deal with this uncertainty. Because dealing with this uncertainty is really crucial to effectively and efficiently solving the perception problem in robotics. So as established, sensors are imperfect devices and it is important that we have a method or methodology by which we can represent sensor uncertainty. So we know that errors occur due to randomness, so unknown or unmodeled reasons, as well as systematic errors. And the quest that we're going to try uh, to follow now is the quest of trying to represent uncertainty in a, in a way that we can exploit it and use it in our perception algorithms. So the key thing here is representation. And there are se several ways by which we can create representations for sensor uncertainty. So since we want to infer features from measurements, we need to know how much we can trust this inference. And we need to represent this uncertainty because we need to know what the confidence is in interpreting what the sensor is telling us. And the key question we're going to ask is what does the sensor's error distribution look like? So the process we're going to follow is we're going to do measurements in a controlled setup as described in the previous slides. And then we're going to create a model. Now there are three different options for creating this uncertainty model. The first option consists of storing all original measurements um, together with the true ground truth measurements. So the measured values are Z underscore I for all measurements I and the ground truth value is X. The second option would be to store a histogram of measurements ZI with a frequency PI. And the third option would be to compute a com compact representation um, or model of uh, this error distribution. Now, the problem with option one is that clearly this is a lot of data 
and what do we do if a new value, value is measured, how do we add that data to our um, table, etc. So this is not a very elegant nor efficient way of modeling um, error distributions. The problem with the second option is that a histogram is also a discrete collection of data um, as the first option and is still uh, can be very approximative depending on the bin sizes that we use. So a little bit more practical than the first option, but still not ideal. And the problem with the third option is, although this is definitely the go-to way of doing things these days, models can tend to be too general, right? So we look, we, we tend to choose a template model um, with perhaps some parameters that we're going to try to fit. And then this template model might not be the right one. So for example, we, if we choose a Gaussian, a Gaussian would only have one mode and perhaps the underlying distribution actually has two modes, is bimodal, or perhaps it has a heavy tail or it is skewed, etc. And these are things that, um, depending on which template model or default model we choose um, at the outset, will affect uh, the accuracy and um, efficiency or applicability of the model that we end up fitting to the underlying data. Okay? So now let's have a look a little bit more at an example of how we would do this model fitting. So what we're going to do here is we're going to represent uncertainty through a parametric model. The process here is we're going to choose a template model. In this case, we're going to choose a Gaussian, and then we're going to match the Gaussian's moments. So the first moment here is the mean, and the second moment is the variance. And clearly, since we are choosing um, a Gaussian as our underlying model, we're making an assumption that our values, so our error distribution, is normally distributed, right? And the empirical formulas for the first and second moment are given by these two equations. So we have the empirical mean and the empirical variance, where our z underscore i's here are the measurements that we take, right? And so we can, given that we know we've completed our measurement campaign, we can then very easily compute these two empirical uh, values, right? Now, once we've got those two modes and we have our mean and our variance, we can actually plot the curve for our Gaussian. We can even fit it onto the same panel as our underlying distribution. Here, I'm showing you a histogram plot of, of true collected data. And you can see now that we have a model that looks relatively plausible for the underlying data. Now, what does this probability distribution function tell us? Well, what it is telling us is, or the, the question that it is answering is, what is the likelihood of obtaining a measurement zi, given that I know that the sensor is placed at a distance x from a given object, right? So that is what this probability density function is telling us. Okay. Now let's have a look at how we can make use of this uh, sensor model. Right. And the question we really want to answer is, well, what is the uncertainty around a given sensor measurement whereby we actually want to know, in the case of perception, perhaps not so much what the likelihood of a measurement is, but perhaps we would like to know what the probability is of being at a certain position, right? So let's think a little bit about how we would make that transformation from this one question to the other question. So let's have a look at this panel here. What we can see here is on our y-axis, we're taking measurements at about 14 distinct distances at roughly two centimeter intervals. And we're bunching these measurements together um, that we took with this infrared sensor for each of the distances um, used in this measurement campaign. Now, if I take a slice through any given uh, one of those distances on my y-axis, we get the model that I showed you in the previous slide, which corresponds to the probability density function that describes the likelihood of a measurement z conditioned on a distance x, right? So knowing that I took a measurement at, say, 15 centimeters, this is the distribution of errors I would expect, right? So that's what a slice through my um, y-axis returns me. Now, what if I want to answer the opposite question? So what is the likelihood of a given distance, xi, given that I take a, me given a certain measurement, right? So this is not an unreasonable question to ask because perhaps your robot is moving along somewhere and it takes a certain measurement 
And given that one single measurement, you now want to answer the question, well, what is the likelihood that I'm 10 centimeters away from a given wall, right? And that is the utility of asking this question the opposite way around. Now, we might be tempted to take a slice of the graph in the other direction. However, Bayes' theorem actually tells us that we can only use this data directly to infer p of x given z if the sum over our pz divided by px is 1 for all i's, meaning that we have a uniform distribution over any measurement, right? So in other words, all measurements zi for any given x or for a given x are equiprobable. And this is not true in general. So a counterexample would be you're in an environment where you see a wall much more frequently from a specific distance than from another. Hence, if you slice through your data vertically, you'd get a skewed distribution that would need to be scaled by p of x. Hence, the takeaway message here is that px of z is in general highly dependent on the given uh, environment. So to summarize, to formally represent the model p of x given z, we need bays as well as values for pz and px for all i's. So now let's talk about another, another type of sensor, so ultrasound or sonar sensors. So first of all, how do sonars actually work? So sonars are active sensors that consist of an emitter and a detector. The emitter produces a chirp or a ping of ultrasound frequency. This sound then travels away from the source, and if it encounters a barrier, it'll bounce off it. So it'll be reflected and perhaps it will return to the receiver. So in this case, because we're talking about sound waves, receivers are generally microphones. So if there's no barrier or if this uh, emitted sound wave is not reflected, it doesn't return um, in general and nothing will be detected at the receiver end. So if the sound does return, then the amount of, uh, of time it takes for it to return can then be used to calculate the distance between the emitter and the object or, or the barrier that the wave encountered and made it um, reflect and return to the uh, receiver. So this is how we would actually implement such a system. So a timer is started when the ultrasound chirp is emitted and it is stopped when the reflected sound wave returns. So this resulting time then is multiplied by the, the speed of sound and divided by two because the sound traveled um, to the barrier uh, and back and we're only really trying to determine how far the barrier uh, away is from our emitter. So it's only a one-way distance that we're interested in. Okay, so very simple um, measurement principle. Now the main disadvantage of ultrasound sensors is that they're dependent or they, they're sensitive to specular reflections, right? So um, this can produce cones and, and the sensor readings would um, are generally interpreted as arcs and not as point measurements. Um, and this can introduce uh, some complexities in uh, the values that are actually being returned um, to the receiver um, device. Okay. But in general, ultrasound or sonar sensors are very benign because they have very linear characteristics given that we're measuring time of flight. So this is some data from an actual measurement campaign, and you can see how beautifully linear the raw ultrasound values behave with respect to their ground truth measurement distances. And, um, also, and on top of that, you can see that the variance is very small. So linearity and very small variance are two very attractive properties for any given sensing modality, because it means that there is little uncertainty in the values um, that we're receiving, and we can use those directly to infer um, the, the, the perception features that we're interested in. Now, there's a small caveat here, obviously, um, and that is, well, what kind of environment was this um, a measurement campaign taken in? And clearly, if you look at um, the underlying paper here, you can see that this controlled setup was very benign, so there was only one surface type, it was smooth, um, and the robot was actually facing it. So no ruggedness, no cones, no sharp acute angles, and that definitely does impact um, the values that are being returned to uh, the sensor. So now I'd like to look at 
a, another type of sensor, which is the laser scanner, or otherwise known as a LIDAR, which stands for light detection and ranging. So LIDARs, just like ultrasound sensors, are based on the simple um, measurement principle of time of flight. In the case of our LIDARs, they're based on a pulse of light. Right? And um, the modality here is coherent light, so usually infrared, where coherence means that all waves are of the same frequency and the same phase. So the start of each wave is at the same time. Um, and this means that all the energy is concentrated in narrow beam. Then, with, as with time of flight, the distance is computed by measuring the time of flight. Um, uh, for example, if you look at a 30 centimeter round trip, the time of flight would be 0 0.002 microseconds, since we know the speed of light. Um, the hardware is con consists of rece receiver emitter pairs, um, combined with rotating mirrors for sweeping to give us more field of view, right? And the common usage for LIDARs is really high-end research robotics or actual commercial applications such as autonomous vehicles. And this is mainly due to the price range of um, LIDARs, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, uh, in a few, a few slides down the road. So the advantages of LIDARs, um, despite their high price and more complicated um, uh, construction, is that they are able to deliver us very high sampling rates and that there is no interference between the emitted beams. So ultimately, they are very precise sensors if we know the conditions, though the environmental conditions that they're operating in, right? So the disadvantages, however, are that they rely on um, moving parts. And let me just see if I can play this GIF here. Yeah, so you can now see how the, the actual measurement principle functions with the rotating mirror to allow the laser rangefinder um, to increase its field of view, right? So you can see here that it does rely on moving parts, which means it has a high energy, energy usage. This tends to lead to more expensive um, constructions or, or modules. Um, they tend to be larger, heavier, and finally, one of the main disadvantages of laser range finders in terms of their, their efficiency for perception algorithms is that they're heavily affected by weather. So light is not only reflected by objects, but it's also reflected by dew or rain or fog um, or strong um, incumbent light sources. Um, all these aspects can heavily impact the accuracy of the measurements that were, are being returned to our receivers. Okay. So as before, we're going to have a quick look at how we might want to develop a sensor model for laser range finders. Now for a LiDAR, what would a feasible um, sensor measurement model look like? Now there's not just one answer to this question. There are many possible approaches we could take to developing a sensor model for LiDARs. And the one I'm going to just briefly introduce here is one example that was first introduced in Truen's book. Okay. So the first thing that we want to do when we're um, dealing with a sensor is we want to apprehend the different types of behaviors that a sensor might um, be in in a certain environment. So what types of behaviors are expected from real world um, laser measurements in, a given, in any possible environments, right? Then once we've kind of brainstormed through possible behaviors, we would list them and we, want to, we might want to compose um, a model that consists or is able to model these various behaviors that we're going to be expecting. Okay, So let's try to translate this rationale into a sensor model. So the first type of behavior we might um, want to model for laser range finders is the event of unexpected um, nearby dynamic um, objects, right? And this is common because maps might be static, but environments are, are in general dynamic and um, the, 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 the fact that we might have pedestrians crossing um, in front of objects that we know should be mapped or we, that we know exist is a non-negligible event and we would want to have that modeled in our sensor model, right? So that's unexpected moving objects that are nearby, um, nearby the robot. Those would be uh, modeled by this increasing likelihood of unexpected dynamic objects as we get closer to um, the actual sensor. Um, then we might have a standard Gaussian to model um, standard random noise around um, the correct range, right? Um, so that would be around our ZI. 
And then, that was, so that would be our second mode. And then we might have a third mode, which here consists of a simple uh, uniform distribution across our whole support, just to, con to consider all unexplained measurements we might encounter, right? So no, for no particular reason, any given measurement might, might happen and we want to capture that through a uniform distribution, okay? And then finally, we might have a fourth component that counts, take, takes into account all failures. So um, sometimes uh, these would occur when an obstacle is missed altogether. For example, when um, the, the LIDAR is measuring something at a very um, steep angle or when the laser rangefinder, um, uh, when the object uh, is trying to, uh, when, when the laser rangefinder is trying to sense an object that is very high light absorbing characteristics, or when it's trying to measure something in very bright light, it might not be able to measure it and returns a failure. And this type of failure has to be modeled through the maximum range um, possible given the sensing modality we have at hand, right? So, so we have these four components we think are reasonable given a certain general class of environments our, our, our sensor would be operating in and given that we know how uh, laser range um, or how laser light um, operates in, in those kind of environments, right? And so we could go um, on to construct a template model, right, for these, that combines these four um, modes, and then we would fit um, the parameters given underlying data, and that would then give us um, our ultimate uh, probability density function, much like we did for the more simple case of the infrared sensor um, a few slides back, okay? So, what kinds of laser range finders exist? And this is, again, an interesting consideration to make because when you're building robots, price does make a difference. So on the TurtleBot robots, which are the template robots or the, stand, the, the default we, we consider in this course, we do also have a laser range finder. It's a very simple one um, in the sense that, although it has a very wide scanning area, so 360 degrees visibility, um, it has a relatively um, low resolution, so one degree resolution. Its detection range is relatively limited, so between 12 centimeters and three and a half meters. Um, and then this leads to a price that is, I would say, reasonable, um, maybe um, at the upper end of what you'd expect to pay for a educational robot platform, right? Um, then a slightly more higher end uh, laser rangefinder, so the Hokuyo, has a smaller scanning area, but the resolution is higher, so we are at 0.25 degrees. We have a, a range of up to 30 meters, so this is very practical when you're starting to do real-world applications, also outdoors. And um, effectively, the price is now higher, so we're 10x more. We're at US dollars of 5,000 compared to 500 before for the TurtleBots um, LiDAR. And if we go to the very professional range, we could consider, for example, a Velodyne sensor with full visibility range of 360 degrees, a very tight resolution, um, so 0.11 degrees, and a very high sampling frequency update, right, which is very interesting when you're in highly dynamic environments. The detection range is up to 300 meters, which is pretty much um, ideal when you're moving at faster speeds. The price, however, is very high, so we're now in the range of more than 24 um, thousand uh, dollars. Okay? So this is just to give you an idea how the price scales as a function of the functionality, the capabilities that we're expecting our LiDAR sensors to deliver. So um, as many of you are certainly aware of, laser, laser scanners are incredibly popular for um, autonomous driving purposes, for applications of autonomous driving, because they Send, they allow us to compose maps or dynamic maps of the environment at a very high resolution by collecting point clouds and inferring the shapes of objects that these point clouds compose, right? So these point clouds, essentially what they give us are depth information um, that is centered essentially at the origin of the laser rangefinder. Um, and so, as you can see in this image here, this gives you a very rich picture of the kinds of things that are happening around your autonomous vehicle. And this is very useful for purposes of trajectory planning. Now, one thing to mention here is that um, although laser rangefinders do bring us or give us um, an enormous richness in terms of information, they have a lot of downsides. Um, the ones that I mentioned before, so the high price, the moving parts, 
and especially their dependency on environmental factors, so weather and bright light, etc., which means that a lot of automakers today are actually not so keen on um, laser range finders anymore. And you will actually see that um, the newest Tesla models and a couple of other automator, automakers are actually not integrating laser range finders at all into their uh, vehicle prototypes. Okay. So moving on to a completely different type of perception, I just like to say a few words about vision. So vision is not at all going to be the, st the focus of this course, and we won't go into it um, at, in, any, uh, at, in any depth at all. But I do want to just put it into the right context within uh, the topics of this course. So vision for robotics is slightly different to vision in general, whereby in robotics, we're actually interested in slightly different um, problem characteristics than classical computer vision would be interested in. So in robotics, we're interested in certain guarantees, such as the real-time guarantees that vision algorithms could deliver. Um, and of course, they have to be able to operate very quickly because we're talking about dynamic decision making when we use vision in robotics. Um, the perception is task driven when we use vision, right? So we're not using vision in general to just classify anything arbitrarily. We usually use vision for very specific purposes. So for example, we want to detect pedestrians and other cars, but are not necessarily interested in having classifiers that can detect any possible object that exists in the world, right? So it's very task driven the way vision is used in robotics. Um, we're using vision in motion, right? So very commonly, the cameras are placed on objects that are moving, and hence we're, we're, we're using data streams rather than still images. So many of you who studied vision in machine learning classes are, are familiar with the vision um, databases that are just collections of static images. Well, we're really interested in streams, which produces completely different types of data sources and um, databases that we would have to process in order to make sense of, right? And finally, what applications do we do we actually want to solve once we have vision algorithms that work? Well, common common applications in robotics are, for example, object tracking. So you have a robot that is trying to hone in to a target or or because it wants to protect the target or because it wants to follow that target for some reason. Um, we might be using vision for information gathering, so you could think of environmental monitoring purposes or a wildlife monitoring, and you would want to do those things in an autonomous manner. Um, and visual odometry is actually also an application that is perhaps more of a means to an end. Um, visual odometry, what it allows us to do is actually it allows us to estimate positions of mobile uh, of autonomous mobile uh, vehicles. So. What, how, how visual odometry actually works, or otherwise known as visual inertial odometry, is by looking at image frames as they come in in your stream, you can actually infer by how much your vehicle has moved along your degrees of freedom by comparing neighboring frames, right? And so this idea is very powerful and, and can allow you to use um, the idea of odometry not using odometers, but instead using visual input, right? And so these are just a couple of ideas and, um, and applications that are very popular within the field of robotics um, through leveraging uh, vision as our perception component. So now I just want to give you another example of a, a cool way of, of being able to sense robots or give robot sensing capabilities. And this component or idea I want to talk about, we refer to as fiducials. So what are fiducial markers? So fiducial markers were most um, recently uh, popularized or made very uh, well known within the robotics community um, by, the, by Edwin Olson at the University of Michigan um, quite a while back actually, um, when he designed this thing which he called the April tag which is basically a piece of paper with um, a print on it that looks very much like a QR code, which allows um, you to easily recognize and position landmarks in your environment, right? And so these landmarks can be like landmarks in the sense they're static um, beacons in your environment, but they could also be placed onto robots so that uh, some robots can easily um, localize and position other robots that are carrying these fiducial markers, right? 
And so the way these April tags work are in the sense that they're uh, conceptually similar to QR codes um, are that they localize um, the, the quad or they detect the quad and the encoding in this quad or in the code allows them to detect the identity of the object and also use the bits in there um, to determine the 3D pose with respect to the camera that is detecting um, the quad, right? Um, so you place the print on an object, you, your, your, the camera that is on the robot detects it and then localizes it with respect to the camera position. So this is incredibly useful. And um, for those of you who are interested in, in more details, I encourage you to look up the original paper uh, that was published uh, in 2011. Okay. And I'm going to show you two examples of how we could might actually use April tags um, to do some cool things uh, with mobile robots. So the first example I'm going to show you here is using a combination of uh, fiducial markers placed on static objects in combination with these objects being accessible over the internet, so over IP addresses. So let me just play this movie. So here you see a setup with a mobile robot and hue lamps that are connected to the internet. The robot can talk to the internet and can tell the network which hue lamps it's seeing given that it detects a given April tag, right? So it knows which hue lamp it wants to turn on once it knows which April tag it's standing in front of. And it does that detection given its onboard camera. Right? And this is really cool because actually the nice thing about this is that you can connect this all up and control the robot and the um, access of the hue lamps over the internet. Okay? Another example that is really cool here is you can actually control the platoon of robots. So you can see that um, the two follower robots are using cameras to maintain a range as well as a bearing to the leader robot. So if the leader robot stops, the follower robots detect that they're getting too close to the fiducial marker they're following and they will also stop. And as the leader robot starts turning, um, the follower robots will also start turning um, given that they are told to maintain a certain range and bearing um, to the, the, the fiducial markers they're supposed to follow, right? And of course, you can think of um, more sophisticated multi-robot type uh, formations that you can do using these um, April tags as fiducial markers. Okay. So now that we've kind of looked at different types of sensors, I want to spend a few minutes talking about the considerations that we would need to make when we're actually choosing a sensor um, to integrate on a given robotic platform. So a couple of or, uh, or four main components or aspects we need to consent, consider are as follows. And the first one is dynamic range, where the dynamic range tells us what the spread is between the lower and upper limits of the input values, right? Um, and this is important because we want to know what types of um, inputs we're expecting in a given environment and how those inputs relate to the task that we're trying to solve. So does the dynamic range cover the task specification, right? Then we have resolution. So this is um, equal to the minimum distance between two values that can be detected by a sensor. Right, so the higher the resolution, the more um, information we get. So we want to make sure that the information we're getting is enough to solve the task we're trying to solve. Linearity is something we may be interested in because it's practical. So does the, behavior, does the output um, vary linearly or non-linearly as our input varies? And is this important um, with respect to the task we're trying to solve? And of course, frequency. So how dynamic are we expecting our environment to be? How quickly does our robot need to uh, react? And this is a very important question, especially if we're thinking of robots that really depend on high frequencies um, to maintain, say, stability or to maintain hover um, or simply maintain um, uh, feasible motion, right? So frequency of updates um, is very important for, for several types of robot platforms. Sensor performance also plays a role. Um, so the first thing we need to consider is sensitivity or cross sensitivity, which is the degree to which an incremental change in the target input signal changes um, the output signal, right? And so cross sensitivity is something that is undesirable. So for example, a compass that is sensitive to a magnetic north might also be sensitive to a ferrous building, 
right? And this is something we ideally would want to avoid. And finally, we want to consider what type of performance we're expecting in terms of errors. So typically errors are measured by either accuracy or precision or both, where accuracy is telling us how close we are to the truth and precision is telling us how spread out we are around um, this accuracy, right? And ideally, we want both high accuracy and precision. And then finally, other factors to consider are, of course, the price, energy consumption, the size and the weight um, of the sensors, um, etc. Okay. So just to summarize a little bit of what we've seen so far, we've looked at inference today by means of a relatively simple um, and singular sensor model. But in general, in robotics, we actually talk about perception as a concatenation of modules within a general perceptual pipeline. So sensing in general would, um, or perception in general, would consist of first the sensing process, then we might be um, using some signal processing to process the raw signal values, then we might feed that into a feature ex extraction um, component via some inference model that may or may not be similar to the models we looked at today. And finally, we would use that to, um, output to um, interpret a scene or the state of the robot or the world, right? And so this altogether is um, our perceptual pipeline. And the length or the sophistication of this pipeline tells us whether we're using a proximal architecture, whereby we'd be thinking of a very short or very simple pipeline, versus a more distal architecture, where we're looking at a long pipeline with a lot of sophisticated modules, right? And so this then ties back to some of the very early concepts I talked about in our control architectures course, where I made the example of, for example, Breitenberg vehicles, which are clearly very proximal. And you can see now by adding all these layers of, of modeling and um, perception and representation, we can make these, these architecture more distal and more sophisticated and ultimately also more powerful. So, so far we've talked about exteroceptive sensing in the form of distance sensors. Now, a key sensor on all mobile wheel robots is the odometer, which allows us to measure how far a robot has moved. So, odometers are based on um, this concept of shaft encoders that allows to measure the angular rotation of a shaft or an axle. And how do they do this? So by the simple application of light and based on the combination of that with two different options or two, two different ideas. So the first idea is given to us by the brake beam shaft encoder, which basically uses a slotted disc that breaks the beam that is being emitted by the emitter that moves around with the, road, uh, with, um, the motor. And the second idea is our reflectance-based shaft encoder um, that is basically based on the idea of a colored disk that affects the sensor reading, right? So you can see here how we have an emitter um, emitting uh, the, the, the light in the detector, um, detecting the returned reflected light intensity based on the color that is uh, moving around, so that color disk that is moving around attached to uh, the, the motor, okay? So these are the two options that we have um, for light-based shaft encoding. And in both cases, what you're doing is you're measuring the rotation of the wheel, which is very practical if you want to measure how far your robots are moving. And so these kinds of odometers or also speedometers use um, ideas as such uh, to determine how far they're traveling uh, or at which speeds. Now, one more thing that you can do with odometers is you can also use the shaft encoders to measure the direction of motion. So how would we do this? So the quadrature encoder here is able to detect um, the direction of motion where a second detector is shifted by a phase of 90 degrees that allows for um, backing out what the sense is of the rotation. So if I play this GIF here, you can see how the 
um, transition of the encodings differ as you move in clockwise versus counterclockwise directions, right? So if you're, work if you're working in clockwise, you would detect the transitions of 1, 1 to 0, 1 to 0, 0 to 1, 0, right? Um, if we encode white uh, with 1 and 0 with black. And in the case of counterclockwise, the transitions you'd be encountering here are 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, and 0, 1, right? So the, the, the transitions are different, and this is how you would be able to detect the direction of motion. So now the question is, how do we use these readings for the purpose of odometry? Right? So what we want to do in odometry is we want to compute the robot's updated position based on these left and right wheel readings. Now, first we're gonna assume that we have um, knowledge of the robot's current state or its current pose given by x, y, and theta. So x, y position and orientation theta in some given um, coordinate frame. And our odometers are going to give us the readings um, delta s for the left and right wheels, right? So the travel distance will then be equivalent to our delta s, um, which is given to us by this equation here on the panel. And so finally, we can use these, um, the knowledge of the robot's uh, previous pose and the updated travel distance equation to compute um, delta x, delta y, and delta theta in our given coordinate frame, where our goal is to update the robot's pose in this given frame. So now looking at the equation on the right-hand side, we simply have x at time t plus 1, assuming that what our, assuming we know what our sampling frequency is, is simply equal to our robot's pose at the prior time step plus this travel distance for x, y and um, our delta theta for our orientation. Right. So since odometers are also sensors, uh, these odometers will also require sensor models. Since odometers are no different, they are also susceptible to noise. And we need to have a way of modeling this uncertainty um, that is given to us through the noise that they are sensitive to. And there are, of course, various ways, again, of doing this. And the, the method that I'm going to be introducing to you today is based on the methodology that is described in Tron's book. And I do um, invite you to have a deeper look and deep dive into that method in your free time. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at how integrating wheel encoder information over time gives us odometry and how to interpret that odometry measurement when we know that there is uncertainty. So uncertainty is, in this particular case, um, when we have wheel slippage or, or wheel motion, is most often uh, due to drift in the actuation mechanism or slippage between the wheel and the surface that it is moving on. Now, how are we going to model that uncertainty? Well, the first thing that we need to do is to simplify the motion um, of, or the way we're thinking about how a robot moves between point A and point B in a given time interval. And the way that Tron introduces this is by assuming that, um, that the motion in, that, in a given time interval can be represented by two rotations and one translation. So if we look at that image in the center of this panel, we have robot pose at uh, time A and time B, for example, uh, given by x, y, uh, and theta. And we then transform the, the translation and rotation into d rot 1, d rot 2, and d trans. So you see with these three components, we can transform any robot translation rotation from one point to another into these three different components. And the notation that we're going to use here is to say that x sub t is a robot's pose at time t, x bar is its position that is inferred through odometry measurements, and u of t is the motion information relative to our prior uh, pose x at t minus 1. So the idea that we're going to leverage in order to model the motion uncertainty or the odometry uncertainty is to use error distributions that are defined over these three components that we used uh, before to describe um, the change in the robot's state. So we're going to define these distributions 
over the two rotational um, motion components and the translational mo motion component. And then we're going to use those three models to evaluate the likelihood of a given robot pose that we're, we're trying to understand whether or not the robot is likely to be there or not. So the first thing we do is we um, describe DROT1, DROT2, and DTRANS through these three equations that we can derive based on first principles geometry. And we then say that, well, now we have descriptions of these three components. We're now going to define um, three error distributions, each of which will be a normal, that will allow us to model how the robot's uncertainty changes as a function of certain motion parameters. And these motion parameters, alpha 1 to alpha 4, um, are described in more detail in Trun's book, and, and I, I invite you to have a look at them because they have different effects um, on the way that we represent how motion uncertainty propagates at, throughout time. Now, in terms of notation, I just want to spend another second on that. What we'll be assuming here is that um, D rot, for example, without the hat, represents our odometry measurements from uh, to a new point. Okay, so D rot tells us how we've rotated from a prior point to the new point based on what our odometer is telling us, and D rot hat is the quantity that tells us. Um, where the robot has rotated to with respect to the point that we now want to evaluate, right? So those are not the same things. So d rot hat is from a given point rotated to a new point, and that new point is the one we want to evaluate its likelihood. So that new point is not given to us by the odometry measurements. It's given to us by a certain position in the map we want to evaluate the likelihood of. And I also just want to point out that the alphas here that we use in these probability distributions, so these Gaussians, uh, can be tuned to give us the noise distributions, uh, for example, as illustrated in this sketch. So by tuning the alphas, we get different types of uncertainty models, for example, more in the radial axis or more in the longitudinal axis, uh, depending, of course, on um, the kinds of uncertainties we have observed in our measurement campaign. Right, so as any other sensor, odometers as well would need to be calibrated. So in the next course, uh, which will focus on localization, we will be making heavy use of this equation that is written on the top of this slide, um, which evaluates the probability of a candidate pose x at a given time t, given that we know the motion that the robot exerted, so u of t, and that we know where it came from at the previous time step, so x of t minus 1. So what I want to do now is go through how we actually compute um, this probability. So recall, first of all, that we assume we know where the robot is coming from at the previous time step, and that odometry is going to tell us how our robot moved uh, by the quantity u sub t. And hence, we will assume that we um, can compute uh, the quantity x bar, which is the new pose inferred from odometry. But what we want to do now is we want to compute a distribution over our candidate pose x of t um, so that we can essentially compute the likelihood of any given pose that we want to evaluate. So I'm going to go through the three steps that allow us to do this. Um, so the first step basically consists of computing our um, delta rot 1, delta rot 2, and delta trans, um, as given in the previous slide, from our odometry information uh, u sub t. Right? So this is all we need in order to compute those um, delta values. The next thing we do is we compute the delta hats, right? where in this function the, the, the equations are simply a function of that new pose, that candidate pose that we want to evaluate, right? And otherwise equations are similar. And in the third step, we compute those three probability um, values as given in the prior slide, and we then compose them to return a joint probability of the pose that we're um, considering to evaluate, right? So x sub t. 
So those are the three steps that we would um, go about to compute the likelihood of a candidate pose. Okay, so now finally, I know we've gone through a lot of material, but as a small interlude to the next uh, lecture, I would like to give you a mathematical intuition about how sensor models are employed um, when we actually have information from several sensors. Okay, so this idea of sensor fusion is extremely popular and common in robotics because more often than not, we're using more than one sensor. And how to combine the information coming from several sensor streams in a probabilistically or formally sound way is really key to the perception problem. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to look through how we actually compute the likelihood of um, a given position. So the convention is that we say that we have the likelihood um, of x, which is equal to, the, to p of z given x, which is equivalent to saying that we have the probability of a given measurement z, given that we know the position uh, x, that, or we assume we know the position x that it was measured at, or we have the likelihood of a given position or pose x, given that we know that z was observed. Okay, so these two things are equivalent. So L of x is the probability of z given x or the likelihood of a pose x given that z was observed. So these are two ways of, re of reading this equation. Now what we want to do is we would like to find out what the most likely pose is given that we made a certain sensor observation, right? And the way we're going to do that is we're going to maximize this likelihood over all um, candidate pose values x. And that will give us our most likely pose, which in turn will tell us where our robot is located, right? So this is really the core problem underlying the localization um, problem in robotics. So what we're going to do is we're going to use um, a method called maximum likelihood estimation in order to do this. So first of all, um, what we're going to do is we're going to assume that we have observed two sensor measurements, um, and Z1 and Z2, um, that were both taken from a given pose X, or position X, um, from two sensors that have the same variance. Um, but we do, however, assume that these two sensor readings are independent otherwise. And we're going to model the sensor error as a normal, so a Gaussian. Now, schematically, we might uh, think of drawing this as shown in the panel here, where the blue curve here corresponds to the sensor model of our first sensor, and the red curve corresponds to the sensor model of our second sensor. And of course, they're centered at this point here around the sensor readings that were observed by the sensors. The likelihood then is expressed as p of z1, z2 given x, which is equivalent to these um, two um, probability density functions multiplied by each other because we know that these two sensor readings are independent, or we assume they are. Okay. So now, given that um, we are assuming Gaussian distributions over x with mean z1 and z2 and the same variance, we can rewrite these equations as written in the first line, right? This is simply the two probability density functions multiplied with each other. And we can simplify them to give us what is written in the second line in this panel. And what you can see here is that our x bar is a new mean. And we can see from the formula that it lies in the middle of our two former means. And the new variance here described by this new Gaussian that we obtain, this simplified Gaussian, is equivalent to the half of the original variances of the original sensor models that we had given to our template model. So let me just summarize what we did here by simply simplifying uh, the, the equation for the likelihood. I had two sensor measurements, both coming from sensors with the same variance, and I now have a new distribution that describes the likelihood of a pose x which has a narrower, narrower variance and its mean is a compromise of the observed means um, that we originally had, right? So this idea here is really the core of sensor fusion. So we're reducing uncertainty and we're compromising between sensor measurements. And this is what the math has told us that happened.
Okay. So we're not quite done yet. We have one more step to do, which is we would like to now compute our best guess for where the robot truly is positioned, given that we made these two sensor measurements. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the argmax of, over this likelihood for all given positions um, over x. And for convenience, we're going to argument the negative log likelihood because it is simply easier to compute, but this is strictly um, equivalent. And so um, by computing the mean over the curve that we saw in the previous slide, we now get this um, uh, new equation, which tells us that x hat equals x bar equals the average over z1 and z2, right? Which simply means that the most likely pose for the robot indeed lies in between the two sensor measurements that were read from these sensors. So now we have our maximum likelihood estimate for the robot's position. And just a side note, we can do a similar computation when the variances of, of the two sensors are, are not modeled by the same variance. So what I showed you in these last two, three slides is how we can actually use sensor models and how we can employ them to combine independent sensor measurements to give us um, estimates of where our robots are actually uh, positioned. So with this, um, this now concludes the content of today's course, and I'd just like to finish by summarizing the key concepts that we've gone through. So by now you should be familiar with a various number of sensors that we can use for localization and navigation. You should understand what the concept of sensor calibration is. You should be able to construct sensor models based on um, sensor model templates uh, that you choose given to uh, according to your uh, underlying application. You should understand the concept of odometry, what it is based on and how to formally describe it. And you should now understand um, the basic concepts, concepts that underlie sensor fusion. With this, I'd just like to leave you with a couple of pointers to more reading that you can do. Uh, I do encourage you to take a look at these, um, uh, at this material. And with that, I'd like to conclude this current lecture and I look forward uh, to speaking to you in the next upcoming lecture.